Okay, thank you for coming back. This is the second last session. Mr. Hashem, next week will be the last session. Um, obviously, we have a lot more to cover. We're not going to get to, but the good news is that a lot of what's, what comes up after this is actually part of the Purim Pesach material, Redemption of the Past, talking about Pesach, and and uh, the Shvatim and Shcheb is also part of the Purim story. So we'll get to that anyhow, and a lot of the other ideas as well, but the rest is in the book itself. The last part of the book begins discussion about, about Yemos Mashiach and what's supposed to happen at the end of days, and specifically what I call the 10th hour. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much Hashkacha Pratis plays a role in, in finding material like this. I mean, it, one safer and another safer, and a lot of times it's the juxtaposition of, of two sforim or three in, in an idea, and sometimes, believe it or not, you can get an insight standing at the bus stop, and a bus, this actually happened to me. I was thinking about something, it was in my mind, a bus went by, and there was an advertisement on the side of the bus, I don't remember what it was for, it was about 25 some odd years ago, and it was like the idea and the, where it's standing and the advertisement combined together gave me an in insight into something I'd never thought about before. And uh, I ended up writing about it in one of my Parsha sheets. So everything basically is, is, a, is a function of Hashkach Prati, specifically Kodesh Baruch Hu tells us we need to know. The, mo the most important thing is to ask him. The most important thing, we, we make the brocha, in, in, uh, in Shema Esrei, we speak about the fact that it's a gift from Hashem. This is not just, you know, this is one of the most important to feel is I think the entire Shema Esri, because everything is built upon das, it's built upon knowledge, built upon understanding. Because, because knowledge is everywhere, as we spoke about before, it's accessible like never before. But wisdom is something that's quite rare. Wisdom is taking that knowledge and applying it to life, but in a way that's meaningful, that allows you to be able to, to fulfill your potential as an individual, to help other people, and to be involved in tikkun olam, the rectification of the world. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned before in the past how somebody shut up in my front door, my next-door neighbor, of Shalom, who at one point in time, you know, we had a discussion about Kabbalah. It was not his thing, per se. And somehow he got his hands on a copy of Shir Shara Gilgulim, Gates of reincarnations. I don't think I had ever heard of it before that time. He walked up to my front door, knocked on the door, and he says, "Here, I think this will interest you more than it interests me." And I actually didn't look at the book for some time um, uh, before I finally got to it. And and it turns out that this book had so many fundamental, so many important insights. I I've spent the last I'd say twenty some odd years with that saver. Never really put it down. I keep learning it eventually translated it, and a lot of the material has made it into different books and different Parsha sheets, different classes, and all because my my neighbor walked up to my front door. Maybe at some point in time I would have seen it, but the way it happened unfolded, and this is the way Das works. It, Shlomo Malach says in Mishle, they put at the front of some of the Gemorahs, the Tam and Gemorah puts it right in the beginning, that if you pursue it like, like money and buried treasures, because that you pursue, that you put your energy into, that you're, you're driven to do. The stories of people that have done looking for buried treasures and for, for wealth. Today we buy tickets in the lottery, which is basically probably less odds than finding a buried treasure. But a person you know, has the, 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 the wherewithal to focus and to stay with it for the longest time. And if you approach wisdom that way, we call das elokim, not just knowledge, but das elokim, then, then you will find it. That's what he says, but only if you approach it that way, because ultimately speaking, wisdom comes from Hashem. We call das chachma bina das. That's why they call it chabad because it comes from that. We say we say we say day bina vahaskel, but they say chachma bina das because those are the three spheres. And chachma is abstract knowledge, abstract wisdom. Bina is already breaking it down and understanding it and making it more palatable, but not necessarily integrating it. Das is when it becomes part of your consciousness and you live by that knowledge and then it becomes wisdom. Then you are able to look at the world a specific way from God's perspective and therefore make the best of it and use the world to your advantage in order to be able to be a partner with Hashem and the rectification of creation and yourself and anybody else you might come across. That's all in Shara Gilguli. Speaks about it there in different story. The end of days... The end of days is a very 
tricky topic. When I first began to speak about it, uh, <laughs> I'm, I was terrified, actually. Right. In fact, it was very even hard. It was it was so it was so hard because of all the bad publicity that Mashiach got, Messiah. You know, first of all, between the Christians and what happened later on with the Chabad Rebbe and the whole, you know that it was so uncomfortable as a as a Ashkenazic Jew to talk about such a topic. I mean, the base medrash it never came up. You know, we it never was a point of discussion. Halacha and you know and and you know how to apply it, and, but but. Almost no one spoke about Baruch Hashem today. That's changed dramatically. But I remember just having to say the word Mashiach used to make the hairs in the back of my neck stand on end. It was so uncomfortable. It's like you know, what, what is it? What's that going? What's that? What's that going to be? What, what, how will I be viewed because I mentioned that word Mashiach? You know, and then Achras Yamin. So actually, I tested the waters first when I began to get more involved, and I began to come across information that clearly, to me, was essential for everyone to know. And that was back then. That was that's going back to 1998, 99, you know, uh, before before the twin towers even occurred. At a time that the sun was still shining, the skies were still clear, and the world was pretty normal at that, you know. And it was very hard to convince people about what might be coming up. But it's only based upon sources. It was it was abstract. It was like it's like you know molecular, molecular you know you know physics where you can't really see things necessarily. But that's the way it's got to be because that's what seems to be going on, you know. And and it, history runs its course, and certain things have to happen by a certain you know point in time only because that's what it says. But there were no indications at that time back in the 1980s, 1990s. You know, and even early, until until the Twin Towers took place, until that that was a turning point. That was a very important corner historically that the world turned that has never returned from. But it was clear that's where we were going. I remember I used to teach a class at Neve Yushalayim because what I would often do is I'd work on the material and then I would come in and teach it up. You know, I would be on my fresh in my mind. I didn't make notes, didn't keep notes. What I would do is I would learn the lesson in the afternoon. I come across important ideas, and I go in and try to distill the information for the girls I was teaching, bring it down to earth. You know, just you know, it was a not nice way to share the, the material. And as I began to accumulate information about the end of days, accidentally, first in the Gemara, then in the lesson, then to do the Zohar, different things, the information was coming to me. I wasn't going after it, as I mentioned before. Talking about the end of days was not my thing, not in the beginning at all. When I first began to write, the only reason that I chose to write was because I was learning so many beautiful ideas in the Gemara. I wanted to share them and remember them. I figured the best way to remember them was to use them, to put them with the books. It didn't exactly work like that. But at least I was writing books and sharing the knowledge with other people. That was the whole purpose. Even after I began to become exposed to Achris Yamin type material, and I began to find out how mainstream it actually had been until recent times that I still didn't like the idea of talking about it. It was, you know, they once asked the Chazanish, how do you know if you're meant to be a teacher or that you're ready to teach? And the answer that I heard him say, you know, I didn't hear him say it, but I heard, you know, that that's what they say in his name. He said, when you're bubbling over with the knowledge, you just find that the knowledge is kind of like forcing its way out of you. Like you have to tell to somebody, you have to share with somebody. He said that, that normally means that you're a teacher and you're and that you're ready to teach, because that it's it's like it's it's a, it's it's ripened, it's matured like a like a good wine inside of you, and and this is the sign that you have to share with somebody else. In Shar Hagil Gulim, he explains what makes teachers and what why some people are not teachers or born teachers, but you know this is an idea, and the same thing happened with the end of days. I really tried to avoid talking about the topic. You know, the first time I, I came on one of my speaking trips, one of my first speaking trips, and, uh, you know, I began to write about this topic. It was before 2001. And I came to, you know, I was brought into the shul to speak. And the guy turns to me before the, the class began, before the shul began. He says, look, I know what you talk about, you know, this whole end of days business, but don't do that here. If you do that, you'll freak them out. They don't want to hear about things like that. I, I, I didn't come to talk about that. I'm still a little bit wary about talking about that, but it was like a little bit, you know, I was taken aback a bit by that, but fine. I mean, I understood right, where you're coming from. After 2001, I was invited to speak specifically about that topic. And you see how Kodesh Baruch Hu, right, how Kodesh Baruch Hu changes everything around. 
and how he, 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 you know, history becomes, becomes, you know, the, you know, a, a vehicle to maneuver people and to manipulate them to do what they have to do. And this is going on all the, all the time. And I began to compile a timeline. I began to compile the information. I actually have a chart over here behind, you know, that actually, uh, you know, shows the whole history time. I, I you know, I started to put the, you know, plot the information onto a timeline. And so eventually it became a class. And the first year I taught it was, you know, the, the third last year I taught it in the Vayu line. And I gave it over and I, you know, put on the board and, you know, they asked questions. But by the end of the three, you know, two or three sessions, I gave it over. Basically, it was like, wow, that's, that's, that's scary. <laughs> that's, you know, they are, they're all going back to college. They're all going back to an America that they believe that they'll be there for 100 years. It's not going to change. They couldn't see how it would possibly change. This was saying it's going to change. And why is it going to change? Because unknown, unbeknownst to most people, there are parameters to history. There is a timeline. What about the fact that people have made predictions for Mashiach's arrival and they were wrong? Well, they might not have been completely wrong. It just might have been Achishana, an early date that didn't come true. Or, as we know from the Gemara, it's possible that Geula can come in increments. So the prediction for a gula may not have been for the gula shlema, but could easily have been for a piece of the gula, a portion of it. And that actually happened. We didn't necessarily see that, but even, for example, the founding of the states, which many may have felt it was a disappointment, a disappointment in the end because it wasn't the gula shlema. All the Jews did not come from all over the world, there's Israel, and, and we didn't gain except the Mashiach didn't show up in the end. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a partial redemption, which clearly it was. Clearly what's, what's followed, you know, in the beginning, maybe it was murky and difficult to see. But looking back over the 70, 80 years and seeing where we are right now, it clearly was part of that process, a big part of that process. And this is how, you know, you have to understand how history works. So, so when you have this parameter and you understand that there are end, end times, and what was, the, what was the main thing? What was the main point? There were a couple of points, a couple of very important points. One point was the fact that, that the, according to, then the first time I saw this was in the Leshem, but then I looked up the Zohar after. The Leshem brings down, he's talking about the Chis Amesim, and, the, and that's one of the things about the Leshem that was most amazing. He, he, he spoke about topics that we may be referred to, but no one seemed to be interested in or have any information on them, even though the Zohar spoke about them. He spoke about them specifically. And he mentioned that the Zohar says, that the chiesamesim, the resurrection of the dead, has to happen before year 6000. Now, until that moment in time, I had learned that it was after 6000, the Ramchal. Everyone learns Der Hashem. Der Hashem is very Kabbalistic, but it doesn't reveal its Kabbalah so much. It's more hidden, it's more camouflaged. You can read it like a, kind of an encyclopedia of, of, of Torah ideas and concepts. And he mentions in, in, this, in, in, in there. But it, and he talks about it a bit, but it seems to me from him that the Chisimesim is really going to be that in the year 7,000, already into the world to come, that the body is going to be resurrected, and the soul will be rectified, that we brought back together, back together again, the Biyomad in the Day of Judgment, and then we'll go on to the other levels of the world to come forever after that. The Chiddush here, the, the, the new idea that the Leshem was bringing down that was a game changer, was he was saying, no, the Chis Amazing takes place before 6,000, on this side of history. And he explains why. He says the whole reason for the Chis Amazing, because what, what do we need it for? We could easily just die and not come back into the world to come. Hashem can do anything he wants. He wants to make us from scratch, he can do that too. But what, what do we need Tichis and Mesim for? So he says that one of the main purposes of, of Tichis and Mesim is to show mankind that God did not make a mistake by making the world the way it is right now. There's two purposes, but that's the main purpose. To show us if God wanted to make the world paradise forever from the beginning, he could have done that. And here he's doing it now, Tichis and Mesim. No evil, no Yitzhahara. The body has been purified. And we're now preparing and moving forward towards the world to come. So we can, he can do it. So why didn't he do it? Because he wanted man 
to be able to be a partner in the rectification of creation, to use their free, his free will, her free, whatever, you know, to fix the world, to fix themselves first and then fix the world and earn the real schar, reward in the world to come. So therefore, that's why he made you know, the world the way it was. But don't think it's because he made a mistake, a miscalculation. It was all exactly the way it was, right down to Hitler and the Holocaust and Stalin and the pogroms and whatever's coming up next and who was in, in the, you know, the in office today. Every last detail, the Medrash says, all pre-planned, hard to understand, you know, difficult to deal with. That's a different story. We have to adjust ourselves, but it was all planned out. So Tehir Semesim, he says, that takes place on this Sunday 6,000 and also in order to prepare us to go to the world to come because the world to come is spiritual. It's kind of a physical world too, but not like this world. It's way more spiritual, like Adam was before the Chet of the Yitzhadas Tovara. So th this skin we have today is the result of the Chet of the Yitzhadas, the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil prematurely. And now we have to go back at some point in time in advance of the world to come to what Adam was like before the Chet. And that was having skin that was made from light, divine light. It's more physical than, than nothing, but it's, it's it's still extremely spiritual. And that's like it's going to be in the world to come. So therefore, Tachis and Mesim is to allow a person to be recreated once again without the impurity of the snake, without the physicality that we live with right now in preparation for the world to come. Those are the two reasons for Tichis and Mesim. That was Chiddush number one. What's Chiddush number two? Chiddush number two was that it's not a short period of time. The, it's, it's a long period of time. Why is it a long period of time? So the Leshem explains that too, based upon the Zohar. Because we don't come back at the same time. Everybody will, will spend time in the ground you know, decaying to be recreated once again into Chis and Macy. We'll all spend the exact same amount of time in the ground. So then what difference does it make it from spiritual, not spiritual, but it's the same for everybody? He says the difference is that somebody who is righteous, somebody who is not overly invested in the physical world and material pleasures, will resurrect from the beginning and they'll come back already in their perfected state and they'll be able to enjoy the light of Hashem on a level that's un unimaginable at this point in time. Everybody else will still be quite physical. So it's very easily, you'll look at your, your window as you prepare to take the bus to go downtown Yushalayim and your neighbors have already come back resurrected are flying like angels because they're all been resurrected. Keeping up with the Schwartzes will be difficult at that time if you weren't at the same level. Because they'll already be spiritually transformed at the beginning. And you'll be, another day's gone by, another day's gone by, right? The last person turns off the lights. So how long will the period of the Chiz Amazing therefore last? If it's staggered, this guy goes now, this guy goes, you know. So altogether, according to Rabbi Yehuda, 210 years. According to Rabbi Yitzchak, two and 14 years. Now, it's a long time, but let's say it's year 5,000. There's still 1,000 years, there's still 1,000 years of history left to go until 6,000 when history, we know it comes to an end. 210 to 214 can be any time in that 1,000 years. There's no way to know what it's going to be. It's not going to mean that much. Once it happens, it will mean something. But until that time begins, it's not going to be, you know, who knows what's going to be. The only time it began to make a difference is when we got close, close enough to the end. That's all that's left is 210 or 214 years or close to it. Because the second piece of information that the Zohar provides is that this period of 210, according to Rabbi Yehuda, and 214, according to Rabbi Yitzchak, and you may ask the question, why there are two opinions, four years, four years apart from each other. So they're based upon verses. What is, is interesting, well, let's go to the next step. <laughs> They both agree, what the Zohar says, but they both agree that the period of Tichis and Macy is going to follow 40 years from Kibbutz Galius, from the ingathering of the exiles. And that for sure shows is on this side of 6,000 because there's no Kibbutz Galius. There's no ingathering of exiles in the world to come. Not necessary. Not a Tichis and Macy either for that matter. So that's part of this world. 
in gathering the exiles as part of our history. That's 40 years, you know, you know, a period of time, followed by either 210 or 214. So we're talking all together between the two periods of time of, of Kibbutz Galias, the in gathering the exiles, and the Chiz of either 250 years or 254 years, depending upon which opinion we're talking about. So, you know, when I first came across that detail, it was 1990. In 1990 was, was the year 5750, or around that time, basically. And no, maybe a little bit later. Actually, I think it was more like 1988, Actually, I don't even remember exactly when, when I first came across that. But one thing was when I saw I did the math, all of a sudden, you know, you work backwards from 6,000, because that's what it has to end. That's what the Leshem himself explains. 6,000 for sure is the cutoff point. You go back to 10, right? That brings you to 5790. Or according to the second opinion, 5786. And that's after 40 years from Kibbutz Galius. And that goes all the way back now to either 1986 or 1990 altogether. And we already passed that point. We'd already gone past 1990 and the Persian Gulf War. It was already well into the end of the 1990s. That meant, by definition, we had to already be in the period of Kibbutz Galius because of the math. And all of a sudden, everything changed. That's when the timeline began to realize that even though history still looked normal, even though it seemed like the world was pretty much the same the way it was since I was growing up, and, and that we're advancing technologically, but, but for the most part, the world was still the same, it seemed like. Jews were still having a good time, good jobs, making good money, nothing to worry about. But all of a sudden, this was saying, that's got to change. Why? Because, for example, if you're traveling from Tel Aviv to Yerushalayim, it's about a 50-minute drive, depends upon traffic and the highway, in which, you know, which way you decide to go, you've got to go from point A to point B by a certain time. You have a meeting in Yerushalayim at 2 o'clock. What time do I have to leave to be there by 2 o'clock, to be there on time? So you calculate backwards. You work it all out, you know, and you take into account the traffic. Nowadays, you can look, look at your ways on your phone, you know, or your computer and figure out whether or not, you know, it's going to be a problem going this way, that way. And you make the calculation, then you have to leave from there. But what time you have to be there and how you're going to go dictates what's going to happen right now. How much more time do I have before I have to get ready and go? So all of a sudden, if we're talking about the Chis Amazing being either, you know, in, in 2026 or 2030, Right, which is only what you know now it's, it's about to become 2022, which is going to be four years to eight years now, not back then. Back then it was more like 20 and 30 some odd years, but still close enough. Then it seemed to be that something had to happen to change the situation. It's like you go to a birthday party. Rashi says, I think, Parshas Vayelech, he says, he says difficult is kibbutz galis, difficult is the in gathering of the exiles. Like, you know, it's like, you know, more than anything else. Why? Because it'll be so hard to get the Jews to want to leave. It's going to be as if God himself has to go and take them by the hand. So I imagined, you know, going to a birthday party where your child is like six, seven, eight years of age is at the birthday party. And before you, you dropped him off, you told him, we have to leave at 5.30. Separate says 6 o'clock, and, my, you know, Abba and I have to go to a meeting. You know, 5.30, we're picking you up. And he says, okay, right? And you drop him off. And three hours later, you come back, and there he is still on the floor. You ask him to be, to be ready with his jacket, his shoes, the whole thing. Shoes are off, sitting on the floor with his friends, having a good time. You know, no jacket, not ready to go. And it's already like 5.25. And you say to him, I told you to be ready. He says, five minutes more. No, we have to go. Five minutes more. No, I have to go. I told you, you're you talking. You know, at some point, he doesn't get up. So what do you do? You have to go over, pick him up by the hand, literally drag him out sometimes because he's kicking and screaming. He wants to stay. And I, I, that, that's like Klai Yisrael. At the end of history, people are not going to want to leave. Hashem is going to have to pick them up and take them by the hand. Now, does that mean a big, huge hand? is going to come down from the sky and take people by the hand? Maybe, maybe, can't say no. 
the Gemara says when the base of Mikdash was destroyed, the second base of Mikdash, that they, you know, that they, I think it was the second base of Mikdash as opposed to the first one. It says they went to the roof, the, the Levium went to the roof and they, they said it to Hillam, a certain to Hillam, but they said to Kush Baruch Hu, that we lost the right to take care of the base of Mikdash. We're no longer worthy of taking care of the base of Mikdash. And they took the keys from the base of Mikdash and they threw them to Shemayim. And it says a big hand came down and grabbed the keys. A frightening sight if that's actually what took place. And then the base of Mikdash was destroyed completely. I believe it was the second base of Mikdash. So maybe there's such a big hand that comes down. And maybe we'll you know, take them all by the hand. Or, like a lot of times, it's a metaphor. A metaphor for how a Kodesh Baruch Hu will carry out the end of days. A lot of times we use metaphors to describe what Hashem is doing, but it doesn't mean he's actually doing that specifically like we might do it. It means ki'ilu. It's as if he did that specific thing. So I'm mapping at this timeline. It's like 1999 and Y2K, you know, Y2K is coming up, which is promising to be exciting. And I'm seeing, just paying attention to the signs, watching the world change. And if you're sensitive to this material, then you start to notice things that other people don't notice necessarily. So, for example, until 1998, 99, until Y2K became a real factor, you know, the, the millennium bug, for those who forget what it was, until that time, all the, new, the mainstream newspapers, they didn't talk about it so much. Maybe just a technical aspect and some of the concerns. But all of a sudden, as we got close to that time, the newspapers began to you know, run articles that discuss things like Armageddon and, you know, and, and the Bible. And then I even began to see the word Torah pop up in the Washington Post and the New York Times and, and mainstream newspapers. The word Torah, this Torah is like, it's a Jewish word, it's a Hebrew word. It's like, we, they, they do the Bible. Ours is like, we do Torah. And it's talking about the Torah and about how, you know, the end of days and then there's different opinions about the entire thing. And you have to scratch your head because Meis Hashem heises us, that's what the claw, the claw is. That is, which is, oh, oh, you know, catches our attention, you know, it's, um, another piece of Ashkacha Pratis, major Ashkacha Pratis. Again, the small things that change your life, but it's all part of the big picture. I was working in Toronto at the time. I'd come back from Mary Israel. I was in Toronto for a couple of years. And I came back to work with my father. And I was working with Aisha Torah in Toronto part-time. And at an office, you know, in their offices there. And somebody came by collecting money for from Eretz Israel, I believe, maybe from, from New York, because he spoke perfect English. But he came by collecting money, for any person, the whole thing, you know, the Beckish and all that. He was printing a safer. And he was collecting money to print the safer. And being a, a new author myself, you know, soft spot for someone like that. So I, I gave him a, a contribution. And while he was there, he gave over to Vartar. He said, he said, he said, I make it a point that wherever I go and collecting money, the least that leave behind the Devar Torah. I didn't, I didn't want to listen to it. I was busy. I wasn't interested in what he had to say, right? But got to be polite. He was much older than me, and he was a nice man, and if he, you know, that's what he wants to do. So I listened. And he said to me, he said, you know, you know there's, there's two types of Hashgacha Pratis. There's overt, he didn't use the exact words, but he, you know, there's times when Hashem works in a very obvious way, and there's times when Hashem works in a very hidden way. He says, how do you know when it's an overt? How do you know when, when, when what Hashem is doing, he's stepping into history like in this week's Parsha, right? This is what Paro says to Moshe Rabbeinu, me Hashem, that I should listen to him and pay attention to him and free the Jewish people. And so then Hashem becomes more, more, more and more overt by doing bigger and bigger miracles until he catches Paro's attention. And he says, how do you know the newspapers are talking about you know this thing about the economy, you know, but th this crisis, that crisis, it actually was at, at the, at the start of the recession at that time, you know, and the you know the news was talking about it, it was big in the news. How do you know if it's just a, a passing phase in history, or it's a Shem stepping in and doing something to trigger something? That's more or less what he was saying. I don't know. How do you know? So he said, David Melch told us. This is from Hashem, that which is wondrous in my eyes, in our eyes. You know, 
everything is from Hashem. What do you mean? Just this? It's all from Hashem. Now, David and Malachi were saying, of course it's all from Hashem. But how do I know that this specifically is something that Hashem has, he's, he's intervened. He stepped in. He's changed it. He says, if it's wonders in our eyes, if, if a recession happens or a virus takes place or anything that catches the world's attention, but there's a logical path. We saw it coming for the longest time. It makes perfect sense given what's been going on the entire time. No one stands, but it's, it's more like, yeah, well, you know, we saw that coming. Then that's just covert oh, oh, divine providence. It's part of the way the world runs. There's all kinds of things happening all the time. For, for decades, the news was boring. Even the things that were happening, you know, car accidents and this and pileups, it didn't catch your attention because it happens all the time. He says, but what's going on right now about the economy and all the opinions and all the things that people are saying, like, wow, I didn't see that shock. You know, all that, right? Shock. This like, it catches your attention. You stand back and say, wow, whoa, didn't see that coming. Where'd that happen? Right? He said, that is not history. Just running its course. That's a Kodesh Borch who's stepping in and doing something. Changing it. May Hashem Hai says us this. He needs us main name. If it's wondrous in your eyes, you have to stand back and say, okay, it's a paradigm shift. Hashem is doing something. He's changing the course of history for some reason, always for the sake of Gula or Galus, depends upon the, the phase we're in. Thank God right now, kind of, that we're at the end of Galus. There's no, there's no more Galus to go to. We've gone everywhere. I don't think the moon is on the agenda for the Jewish people, I am hoping, right? But, 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 the world, we've, we've gone to the four corners, the part that says, they'll take us back from the core, four corners of the earth, not the four corners of the universe. So it's like we're at, in that gula stage and things are happening and it's, it's standing out, it's in the news and it makes us wonder. That's a Kodesh Baruch doing something, changing things. So, you know, all of a sudden, you know, for example, in 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down. I remember, clear as day, even though I did not know this material yet, but I do remember that the event at that time. And I remember watching the news and how they were tearing this wall down just after perestroika was, you know, introduced in 1985, 86 at that time. And they were, they were saying things, for example, that this is an important first stage towards, you know, to opening the Iron Curtain and, you know, granting, you know, you know uh, independence to the Russian states and all that, you know, but it will take years. And they began to talk about the, re the reunification of Germany, both Berlin, well, at least uh, Berlin, East Berlin and West Berlin. And I remember like a week or two before them saying that will take at least a year or two because, you know, the Russians have to clean the place up, get all their secrets out of there. You know, it wasn't going to happen overnight. And then it happened overnight. And on top of that, I remember marching downtown Toronto when Kosygin was, was, was the prime minister of Russia, uh, trying to get Jews out of Russia. We were like, you know, staging a protest to get Jews out of Russia, but it seemed like the most impossible thing. If you wanted to leave, you left behind everything and you were, you, you were vilified and very, very hard. And all of a sudden, the Russians, it comes out, they need billions and billions of dollars to survive. Their economy is tanking. So they turn to Reagan and they, it's so hard for the Russians to do this. But they turned, they, they, first they put Gorbachev into power, who's a, a more liberal you know, Russian leader than, than has been ever, I think, going back to, you know, Lenin and all the way back to the beginning. They put him in, you know, in power, and he has the gumption to turn to the world to get financial help, otherwise they're going to be big trouble. And Reagan puts top of the priority, top of the list, that he has to let the Jews emigrate if they want to go out. You want the money? You have to open the door for the Jews. A remarkable thing. I think that's the reason why. If I had to guess, I don't, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but if I had to guess, I'd say... That's probably the reason why of all the presidents who have left office and died outside of office, he's the only one that I'm aware of who got the cross-country tour. You know, they took his, his, his coffin again all across the whole country for people to pay their final respects. A lot of covet was given to him after he died, unlike other presidents. So I think one of the reasons why is because he, he, he made this fantastic, important gesture on behalf of the Jewish people. And of course, they agreed to it and all kinds of Jews came out for better, for worse. But, but it was certainly a, a change, a major change. And the Malbim, 
right? He speaks about, you know, he talks about in Yirmiyahu, on a pasuk from Yirmiyahu, talking about the end of days. And uh, he mentions that, that uh, well, the pasuk itself refers to the Jewish people using the name Yaakov, B'nai Yaakov, and B'nai Yisrael. And in the pasuk, it makes perfect sense. We, we have both names. It's very often Tanakh that they will use both names you know, interchangeably. Even by Yaakov, if you knew that was the case, but certainly by the Jewish people. And if you read the pasuk itself, it doesn't make you stop and say, oh, what's going on over here? But the Mabing did. He asked the question, why was it that the Pasik makes a distinction between, between B'nai Yaakov and B'nai Yisrael? Why are they both names mentioned? Because, he explains, that Yaakov is the name of the Jewish people in Chutzlarts, in the diaspora. Yisrael is the name of the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael. So why the distinction? So he says... That the Pasuk is telling you, because it says it will be the heads of nations. He's predicting, going back to the 1800s, this is unthinkable in his time. He says that there'll come a time when the exile will come to a close. Finally, after thousands of years of being in exile, it'll come to a close. The Jewish people, after being killed and murdered and, and, and you know everything bad, will finally earn the respect of the Gentile nations. And they'll even become heads of these people, bankers, you know, you know, politics, whatever. But they'll be able to have equal positions. They'll be able to have control and power and live decent lives, which means, of course, being able to buy houses like the, the Gentiles buy houses and cars and live a good life like we've had for 40, 50 years with tremendous equality, quite unprecedented in, in recent times. He said, that's what's going to happen. It's gonna, the, the day will come that will happen. Now, when he wrote that, and even a year before it, you know, it actually happened, it was like, well, yeah, one day the Mashiach comes, but not in my lifetime, I don't think. You know, that's, that sounds like a big deal. All of a sudden, it happened. The last place that millions of Jews are being held captive in the world against their will is in Russia. And now, Pitom, out of nowhere, shocking the entire world, the door swings open. And the wall goes down. They tear the wall down. People who decide they're not going to wait for the politicians to work it out. They tear the wall down. And we're all thinking to ourselves, they're going to shoot them because they're breaking into East, East Berlin. They're going to shoot them because they're, they're like little, like, you know, they don't. And all of a sudden the wall comes down and they work it out and, and, uh, and the world starts to change. It's amazing how, you know, until you get something, it seems like impossible. And once you get it, yeah, that's the big deal. You just get used to just like that. But it was like, all around 1988, 1990. And then comes the Persian Gulf War, right? The Persian Gulf War, another example of I mean, this, this vort that that rabbi gave to me, oh, if, if, I, if I'd known how much I would use it and rely upon it, I'd go back and give him a much bigger donation in the end. It, absolutely fantastic from like literally like he can't have a game he came in the short little divar tour they, they they're, they're game changers they're life changers they're mentality changers and they're another piece of the puzzle you put in oh wow that now explains that and the persian gulf war begins and we can't understand why we're scratching our heads also actually i got ahead of myself before that there was intifada which we'll come back to later on but in the meantime, this war begins, and it doesn't make sense. Saddam Hussein decides to go and attack Kuwait. He wants their oil. He wants their gold. They're such a major, you know, you know point of, of export for the world, America, you know, the other Arab countries. What do you think was going to happen? We're all going to stand back and let him take over Kuwait and control the place, and no one's going to get involved? That's his gamble over here? What do you think was going to happen? Exactly you know, what we thought would happen. The Americans went in, they fought the war together with the British and others as well, and until, you know, it took a while till they finally, they finally were able to overcome him and, you know, eventually he was killed and, and, uh, and you know, we never really fully resolved the problem, but certainly not the way it was before. And, and then it was over, just like that. And yet the most important point in all of it is basically you have to you have to look, you have to be, you have to, you have to ask yourself the question. What's the wondrous part in all of this? 
What, what, you know, in fact, recently they, uh, Donald Trump was quoted as saying that, that uh, until he came along, uh, the, the Jews controlled Congress for the longest time. When they wanted something, they asked, they, they took it. The truth is he's, he's, not, he's not correct. That began to change already in 1990. What happened? So this war had to be fought against, against Saddam Hussein. And the Americans required a place to use as a base. They couldn't use Israel, that's for sure, because that was enemy territory. You're not going to get the cooperation of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and, and, and Iran, wherever all the countries around, if you're going to be in Israel. So they had to find an Arab country to use as a base. Now, until that point in time, if you recall, that every time that the Arabs referred to the Americans, they called them the Great, great Satan. That's what America was called. And that was their pen name for the American people, the great Satan. That's who they were. And Zionist, whatever. To all of a sudden make a pact with them against, you know, against the, a fellow Arab, right, was like unprecedented. It was un, it's un, unspeakable, unheard of. But the Americans asked anyhow. And the Saudi Arabia, they, they said, yes, you can use our land as a base and fight against Iraq because it's to our benefit anyhow, under one condition, that you, you stop fighting on behalf of you know, the, the Jewish people so much and you stop them from building in Yehud and Shamran. Now, at that time, Ariel Sharon was the housing minister and he was 100% for building in Yehud and Shamran. It was a 180 degree turn he made later on by the coup. But at that time, that's the way, you know, and the Americans complied. They put the pressure on. At that, it was who was uh, George Bush Sr. was president, I believe, at the time, and uh, it, and they actually went along with it. He was never crazy about the Israelis, anyhow, especially since they bombed the Iraqi reactor using American planes. But uh, that's yeah. And all of a sudden, APAC protested, right? The American Jewish lobby, the main one that had usually the ear of Congress for the most part, a lot of congressmen got a lot of things on behalf of Israel in the better times, complained and tried to inter intervene in what was going on between the Arabs and the, and, and the American government. They weren't able to. It was the first time they, they wrote about it. It made the news. It was the first time in, in, since the beginning, I think, that APEC was turned down. And you could feel the change. You could feel that we'd gotten to a peak, the climb, and it was. And what brought it out? This war. Had it not been for this war, the, the great Satan would not have to had to pursued the Arab world to get their cooperation, and maybe the relationship with the Israelis would have would have still you know, lasted longer. But it wasn't the time. 1990. Well, 1990 was a very significant year. That's the year, first of all, that the Vilna Gaon predicted would be the redemption of Gula. If not in whole, it's certainly in part. And that's the year, according to Yehuda, if you're working backwards from the 210 years from 6,000, it brings you to 1990 as being the beginning of Kibbutz Gullius, the ingather of the exiles. So 1986 to 1989, the Jews are getting out of Russia. Now, here's what the Malbim says, though. This is the important part. He says, this is what's going to happen. The Gullius is going to end in, in wherever the Jews are. Right, they'd be the last place. Now, after that, there's small pockets of Jews here, but that was the last major exile of Jews against their will was in Russia. The doors open up, like the mob being predicted, and exactly as the mob being predicted, we're rising to the top of Gentile society. Exactly, it's amazing. He said this back then, and here it's happening, and we're taking it for granted. And then he says, "But there'll be a split in the Jewish people." That's what the pasuk is telling you. There's going to be a split. The split will be between Yaakov and Yisrael, because the Yaakov party says will be the larger part, and the lesser part, he says, but the larger part. And they're going to say, oh, this is wonderful. After so many years of being exiled and suffering and being tortured and hated, and you name it, reviled, everything, we're, we're, we're accepted as equals now. It may not be the full redemption, but it's enough redemption for us. We're okay. This, we're, this, we're happy with this part already. And the Malbim says, but a small component called Yisrael will say, yeah, it's nice, but it's not the whole thing. Until we go back 
to Eretz Yisrael, rebuild the base of Mikdash, bring the Shekhinah back into the base of Mikdash. It's not called Geule, and we are now going to work on behalf of the Jewish people to bring that about. Because that's what's going to happen at the end of the day. So that's where he leaves it. Now, there's another Medrash, very interesting Medrash. Again, it's like Hashgacha Pratis. There's no way to explain it. It's like, it's like literally, you know, if you want to learn, you want to see, Hashem brings it to you. So I came, I was in a shul once and extra time, picked up a safer, never saw it before, called Tucha Yabiu. Two, two volumes set on the Chumash. Looked interesting, picked it up. Randomly, well, it wasn't random, but randomly turned to Parshas Balak and just started reading. It wasn't part, well, I think it was Parshas Balak, not so random, probably. But I turned to Parshas Balak, <laughs> then I found it on Parshas Balak. That's another story. I open it up, right? And there's a mantrash right at the beginning. Right, I believe. Sorry, either be right, but it's right in Parshas Balak. I have to go back and review these things after years. Start to forget some of the details, but that much I remember. Parshas Balak, and what's he what's he talking about? He's talking about a very famous Gemara in Baba Basra. And Baba Basra gets around Ein Gimel, so it's talking about different different you know uh, levels of ownership, and you know it talks about you know bathhouses and houses and land and then what constitutes ownership and how do you you know take control of it. And then talks about boats, you know, which and if you sell a boat, you know, what's included in the sale of the boat, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It talks about these things. Then it digresses, as the Gemara is wont to do, very often, to give over some medrash, some, some torsha ball pair that's not halachic. And you use the whole story of the boat to talk about an incident with Rabbi Babar Khana, very famous Tana, and he and has all these stories. For two pages over here, famous stories of Rabbi Barachana. And one story is they're out on a, on a boat. They're sailing on this boat, right? And they get to a point where they, they see what looks like an island. It seems like what looks like an island. And uh, they decide to get off the boat, right? So they, it's a very bizarre story. Right? And they come to this island and they get off on the, onto, you know, onto it. They get off the boat, right? And then they start to start cooking something because everyone knows you go to an island to start cooking, right? So they you know, start cooking and baking, take out the oven, the whole thing. I don't know where they got it from, but anyway, but that's a cooking, right? Sitting on the campfire. And all of a sudden, the island begins to shake because it turns out, you know, unbeknownst to them, and unfortunately, it wasn't an island. It was a big fish, a very big fish, because it has to be a very big fish to be so big, so upside down. I don't know. How do you not notice the eyes? It's just like sitting around sunbathing. What's this fish doing over here? Whatever, whatever. We don't need to ask such questions. It's a medrash. Was it true? It doesn't have to be. The point is. So what was the point? So it says that they, they when the fish really you know, felt the heat, the fish began to turn over because, you know, to put its belly into the water or whatever, right? And they fell off into the water. And they, they said that if... The boat had not had been close, close at hand, they all would have drowned. And that's the end of that story. Now, I, I saw that story and heard the story probably about 10, 15 times. You know, never ever learned anything meaningful from it that I could point at. I mean, the Vilna Gon, he talks about these things and shows the marshal and things like behind it. But until I saw the Sefer, Tubucha Yabiu, didn't know what to make of this Gemara. And I didn't, quite frankly, I didn't care to make anything of this Gemara. I got it along the way to the next halacha. But the Sefer, I mean, the thing is called Beis Yechil, brought down in Tuvacha Yibiu, says, you know what this, this story is? Actually, it's a Rabbin Yaakov who lived in the 1800s also. He, he was uh, one of the, the Perushim on the, uh, on, uh, I think it's Ksosa Choshen, and also on the Gadat of the Gemara, he wrote different things. And he, and he brought, and I think the base Yechil brings him down, talking about this Gemara. And this, he says, this Gemara is talking about the end of days. How? What? He says, here's, here's what Rebbe Barchana was telling us. He had a Ruch HaKadosh, as the Tanaim often did, because the Zohar, a Tanaim, Rebbe Meir, Rebbe Kiva, they saw things. They saw the future. They had Ruch Kaddish, Whatever it was, somehow they had a sense 
was going to happen at some point in history. And they wrote about it. And they buried it in Midrash and the Gadata for us to find it later on, for those who are worried to, to come across it. And he said, Rabbi Barakana built into this story what's going to happen to the Jewish people at the end of days. And he says that what he's telling you, right, the boat is the Jewish people, is Eretz Israel and the Jews living the land, right? Or no, it's, it's just the, the Jewish people. They come to the, to, the, to, to, the, to the fish, which represents Eretz Israel. And he says, when they come here, the Jewish people are going to rule over another people, a, a, a weaker people that they think they have complete control over. And they're going to mistreat them. They're going to abuse them. They're going to make them angry. That's what the major says. And I remember, you know, I, when I first as a bocher in the, in, in the yeshiva, way before I was married, and I used to go shopping in the Makola. And they had Arabs working everywhere in the Makola. In those days, he used to walk to the Arab shuk. They were thinking twice. We never worried about Arabs. Once in a while, there was an incident. You took Arab taxis without thinking twice. You got ripped off, but you didn't, you know, you didn't think it, you didn't, it didn't make a difference to you in the beginning because that was the state of affairs when I first got there at the beginning of the 1980s. And uh, after I got, I got married later, later on, around 1985, 86, we were still living in the old city. I detected a change. But before that happened, around that time, the way that people talked to these workers, they treated them like donkeys. They treated them like little, like, like animals. They were very completely disrespectful. Now, for an Israeli, there was no big deal because they were used to that. The Arabs, Jews, you know, didn't have respect for one another. They worked together if they had to, you know, mortal enemies. So it was kind of like accepted. They talked about us that way. We talked about, you know, but coming from Canada, it was just very hard to be, to be soulful, to watch this happen. And I'm thinking to myself, that, that can't be good. To talk to them like that. That's got to like, you know, it has to register. It has to, have, you know, you know, do something. Change, like, you know, it's going to make them angrier at some point, and then probably they're going to rebel. This is long before I saw the Medrash. And I remember one day in the old city walking back to my apartment and watching the Arabs in the street, and you could see they weren't the same anymore. They weren't afraid anymore. The fear was gone. And you're used to the fact that the Intifada has been already, you know, you know 20 years, somebody, you know, this, 30 years at this point in time. I remember back at the beginning, I was here. And when I first got here, the Arabs were afraid of the Jews, at least the ones living near Israel. But you could feel that change. You could feel the shift. They were no longer afraid anymore. And you knew that that's going to lead to something. And the Madras says that the Jewish people will treat them as if they're second class citizens. And if what will happen at some point in time, they will the fish turning over is these people flipping the situation around. That's what he says. That's how he interprets this medrash. And the boat is Mashiach. And Rabbi Chana said, if the boat wasn't close at hand, we would have drowned. And the and the the Ben Yaakov says. Rabbi Khan is saying that when, the, when these people, he doesn't say Palestine, he doesn't know what the Palestinians at this point in time, but when these people finally rebel, if Mashiach is close to the hand, then we will be okay. We'll survive it and everything will be fine. But if Mashiach is not there at the time, we will drown from the problems they create for us. That's what he wrote back in the 1800s. <clears throat> now, the base Yechiel, who's writing about all this, says that he was in the Mir Yeshiva after the Yom Kippur War, and he showed this Madrash in Rebbeinu Yaakov to the Rosh Yeshiva of the Mir, I forget which one it was again, but he, it's mentioned in the Sefer, and he says this is clearly Ruch Kodesh because clearly they could never know this is the situation that we're dealing with in our time. And this is still before the Intifada. I mean, it literally turns it around to the point that you, you watched and it hurt to, to hear the media, specifically CNN, which at the beginning was considered to be a, a reputable news reporting station, but today is known to be just literally the initiative of the, of the Democratic Party and all the information they put out and they want people to know to the point of even, even working as hard as possible to undermine the previous election. And they literally took the name David and gave it to the Palestinians. They staged you know, attacks 
on the Arabs as if the Israelis were doing it. They have these Palestinians swing, you know, slingshots like King David. And who's the Goliath now? That's the Jewish people. The fish turning over. And if Mashiach is close at hand, they will be okay. If he's not, we're going to drown in the problems that they create. We have been drowning for 20 some odd 30 years. What the heat the, not the the rejection of so many important families from a piece of land that was developed from the bottom up to be a prosperous place, something that the Israelis were completely proud of, <coughs> to give it up and destroy those families for what? A terrorist base in the end? It's because of the problems that the Infanta created. All the world opinion changed. At the beginning, we weren't always the favorite of the world, but we weren't the enemy either. And all of a sudden, all this, you know, you know, this anti-Israel sentiment building, 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 building. A little too right there in the Medrash. Exactly on time. See, that's the most amazing thing. Putting together the timeline, right? You know, there's lots of them. There's many timelines that have been created for Gula and Mashiach's arrival. But when you take that timeline, you have, to, you have to apply it to history and say, okay, well, here's what it says. Here are the dates. Let's look at history. Did anything happen at that time that was significant that we could say that's part of that? Now, every other time that I looked at, it didn't work out. It was always, you know, fetching, shoving, putting in, you know, trying to get a square peg into a circle. It didn't work out. But all of a sudden, when I plotted this, this information, this chart, this timeline, and every, anybody wants a copy of it, just let me know. I'll be happy to send you, you know, in a, in a, as an attachment, in the, as an email, right, the, the whole thing. But it's, you start to plot the points and you look at the events of history and Me'es Hashem Haisa Zos Kinefus Be'neinu, it fit in. And not just fit in, but here's the most powerful point at all. This is the most, it should, it should allow you to make predictions. So in 1999, Right, almost two thousand at that point in time. One of the last times I'm teaching this class, right, it was a three session class, and I said, you know, this is where we are today: the Jewish people living in the diaspora, principally America. That's where almost six million Jews were living. The other places there is Israel, and Canada is only a hundred, couple hundred thousand, would be less. England, but the main stages: Eretz Israel getting bigger. And America. So America is like, you know, for uh, so many other reasons, which we have talked about in the past, and maybe we'll get to next week, Bezor Hashem. But, you know, all of, a, all of a sudden, you have to look at all these events and see what's going on. And they start to fit in. The, the changes are taking place. But, but even before that, we have this attitude that I don't want to go. People who just don't see any reason to go. When I first made Aliyah, it was like to each his own. You know, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. You know, I, couldn't, I couldn't impose it upon somebody else. People didn't buy into it. Why? Why should I, why should I do it? Maybe retirement is like that. And here's where we have to go. Geula. The Jewish people have to come back there to Israel. Everyone who's surviving. No one stays behind in America. No matter how many stories you hear and how many rationalizations there are, that's not the mainstream opinion. When Mashiach finally comes, any Jew surviving comes back there to Israel. <clears throat> Even if you want to say, and we do say, that the entire world increases in Kedusha once evil's gone, so the entire world is, is elevated to the status of Eretz Israel today, Eretz Israel also goes up, and Eretz Israel gets the status of Yisraeli. So there's no change in the end. Everyone's gone up. right? If you get a promotion, he doesn't, and he went up. but if we both get a promotion, okay, we both went up, but we're still you know, in the same distance of, apart from each other. And you should lie and get the status of the Kodesh Kodeshim. So Eretz was always the place for the Jews to be, ultimately for sure. And we're not in Galus. That's where we have to be. That's the Yerushalayim. Here's Tel Aviv, Yerushalayim, you know. And, and we only have this much, much time to do it. And nothing's happening to make a change. The rabbis aren't talking from the Bima or the Stender or the pulpit, whatever the case may be, telling us, listen, folks, it's late history. We know what happened to the end of every X that we've witnessed, it, we've seen it. We can go back and read the history books. So, you know, it's going to happen again. Let's get ready. No, nope, no such discussion. You know, Barrel Wine talks about, in a class I once listened to on his tapes, about the very topic. And he says this mentality that we had. He was in America still, or he just made Aliyah. He used to be a rabbi, Muncie, and he's speaking about how they were talking about renovating the shul. 
and they're going to put a new skylight into the shul. So that the skylight, you know, could either last for 150 years or 250 years. They're having a debate right now in the boardroom about which one they get. And he says, what are we talking about? 150 years. You know, hopefully Mashiach is going to be here in the next couple of years. No, in their defense, it says that all the Batim Midrashas and Shuls fly there to Israel. So maybe it's still worthwhile getting the 250 year skylight. But that wasn't the mentality. But it's like, we're going to be here for a long time. So let's get the best. There, there wasn't such a consciousness. So whenever that's the case, whenever the Jewish people lag behind history, a case is coming up and we're not getting it. Hashem is sending the messages and we're not reading them. We don't want to, we're not listening. The only logical thing that we can, it doesn't have to be that way, but it seems to us, the only logical thing is going to be that something has to happen that's going to change the way we look at the world in history. I don't know what it is, but it has to happen. In fact, I wrote a book called Not Just Another Scenario. The first one in the summer prior to September September, uh, September 11th that year. Predicting some major event. No idea what it was. When it finally happened, I got phone calls from people. How'd you know? How'd you, how'd you, how'd you know? <laughs> it's, like, you know? It's very simple. Just look at Jewish history. Just look at where we are. Look what we have to get to. Look at the time. Just put it all the, the big picture. The big picture. Look, put it all together. Right? If, if you look at your watch, I have to be in Yushalayim by 2 o'clock. And I look at, oh my God, it's already 11 o'clock. I'm behind schedule. You start, you know, Shabbos is coming in. Right? And I got two cakes to bake and there's only two hours left. What do I do now? And you start adjusting. And I was like, you know, extreme times, you know, call for extreme measures. We figure it out. Right? Likewise, Jewish history. Always. If we're not up to par, we're not up to the schedule. So Kosh Baruch will do something. It was predictable that something like that was going to happen. That specific thing? No. Not a clue. But something. And it happened. And it's been happening and happening and happening and happening. I've often pointed out that the best trait that Jewish people you know, can have in Galus is the ability to adapt. To be able to make, you know, make the best of a situation. And the worst trait that we have is our ability to adapt because we just get used to things and just you know, don't change. But here we are. Next week, Bezrah Hashem, we'll talk about the 10th hour. That's really the key to the entire discussion. If you have the book, you've read it, you've seen it for yourself. It's an absolutely remarkable concept and, and idea that just plugs in. All the pieces come together. They really do. And here we are today. When I first gave this class, it was, an, it was an abstract topic. It was a, just an, an idea in the air that you either took my word for it and believed the sources you didn't. Now I sit here in a situation where I'm actually watching the world fulfill all those things in reality, in actuality. So you got to know it. You got to prepare for it because, because what's coming up next and how we deal with it depends upon how aware we are of what, what to expect and, and, and how, to, how to respond to it. That's all part of having the big picture. Okay? Good night.